Good morning, dear brothers and sisters of Christ. It's great to be back with you again for our weekly chat, hoping that this past week has been a blessed one for you and your family, that you're doing well, and you're enjoying this fast-free week after the Holy Feast of Pentecost. This morning, I want to take a look at two questions that I've been asked many times over the years by my faithful but also by Orthodox friends alike. The first is, what is the difference between an atheist and an agnostic? And secondly, what are we as Orthodox Christians supposed to say to them to help them see the truth? So stay tuned. As always in our podcast, if you do have any comments or questions, please enter them, and I'll try to get to you as soon as I can, if possible. So let's begin with the prayer to the Holy Spirit. O heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Okay, let me start with uh, some reflections on, on this whole issue of atheism and agnosticism from a wonderful book called Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, by Father Andrew Domic of the Antiochian Archdiocese. Because he, he starts with some really interesting reflections and questions. And he says, the two terms, agnostic and atheist, are used by people to mean a number of different but related things. And here are some examples. I do not believe that there is a God. I believe that there is no God. I have no beliefs that have anything to do with a God. I know that there is no God. I have seen no evidence that there is a God. I cannot know whether there is a God. No one can know whether there is a God. If there is a God, I don't like him and want nothing to do with him. I don't believe in your God. People in that church are hypocrites, and I want nothing to do with them. Religious people have done bad things in the name of their God. Father Demick goes on to write, There are a lot of assumptions, many of them simply factually wrong or incomplete, that lie behind many of the statements that I just read. For instance, a lot of atheists have rejected faith in God because they don't like the way God has been presented to them usually as a tyrannical, arbitrary punisher. The best response to that problem is simply to show them that orthodoxy does not believe in that kind of a God either. God loves everyone and wants to heal everyone, and that healing is available to all who cooperate with him. Another of the most common objections to is that religious people do bad things, sometimes in the name of their religion. This objection has some genuine substance to it, but there's a logical fallacy here. The fact that a person who says he's a believer does something bad, and don't we all, doesn't mean that there is no God or that his religion is false. While there are some religions that demand bad things, such as human sacrifice, the bad person under discussion may actually be violating his own religion. Of course, the obvious example in today's world is that of clergy who abuse children. I've never heard of one religion that condones this kind of behavior. At the same time, anyone who objects to religion because of killing and religious wars has only to consider the 20th century's bloodbath at the hands of atheistic governments. If Stalin's work in murdering doesn't delegitimize all atheism, neither should the Inquisition 
illegitimize all religion. Sometimes we do have to ask God to save us from his followers because those people are not actually following him. Probably the biggest issue with atheists and agnostics is the question of evidence. Where, where exactly is this God that believers claim to know? That is indeed the crux of the matter, right? Reason should make it apparent that no one can honestly say, I know that there is no God. Why do we say that? Saying such a thing would require that someone have knowledge of absolutely everything there is. And that, of course, is ridiculous. Just consider the analogy. A needle may be placed in a haystack, but unless absolutely every piece of hay is examined separately, we can never say there is no needle there. While a person dedicated to finding that needle does not have the possibility of being that thorough, no human being could ever examine the whole universe to see if there is a God anywhere in it, right? Not only would that require the ability simultaneously to observe all the parts of reality that we can theorize as existing, but it would also require that we have perfect knowledge of everything that might exist at all in every way, shape, or form. What if there are other dimensions of reality that are not bounded by our universe? And, if, and even if we knew all the possible space that needed to be explored, do we have the right kinds of tools to detect what, it, what is present in it? The answer, of course, is no. Or what if we directed a God, what if, or what if we detected a God but didn't know whom we were seeing? The issue here is what tools are being used to see the evidence. The Bible itself tells us that some things can only be seen with eyes of faith. And that's a very important distinction. Orthodoxy also teaches that some knowledge only comes through experience, usually only through a long struggle in asceticism and repentance. The Lord Jesus says it is the pure in heart who see God from the Beatitudes. Just for a second, think about in your own lives, my dear viewers, those times when we've entreated God to help us, when we have felt something, my words now, not yours, otherworldly about an experience that we were going through and realize that something happened that was beyond my understanding. As a believer, of course, we would attribute that to the, the hand of God, God's grace, God's love, God's mercy, whatever. But those who are, who are atheist and don't believe in God, and those who are agnostic, who believe in, in something but they're not sure what, because there's no way to prove it, would really struggle with that. In my own humble opinion, many people who say they, they do not believe in God have found ways to criticize and condemn God for things that they've experienced in their lives. Um... Many times I've been in discussions with, with people who have fallen away from the faith, who have given up belief in the faith uh, because of what kind of a God would allow children to die or to be murdered? What kind of a God w would allow cancer and, and debilitating diseases and terminal diseases? Um, and when you try to explain, you know, the whole concept of, you know, living in a fallen world, you can see that they just shut down. They don't want to, they don't want to deal with that. Um, they want proof that if there is a God, what kind of God would, would allow that to happen? And, and I think the, the real crux of the matter is, as the Beatitudes say, you know, um, blessed are the pure in heart, meaning... Our hearts must be in tune to seeing God in all his glory. 
how even in when living in a fallen world, he still is present and, and, and working within us. And that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. Let, let's be honest. That's a challenge. Um, so how do we help people to see God who just don't see him? It's tough to insist that they have to enter the church and embark on a lifelong journey of asceticism before they'll see God. Few people will take you up on that invitation. Nevertheless, the key is in the words of Christ that seeing God requires purity of heart. Most atheists and agnostics will at least acknowledge that morality is a good thing, even if they refuse to adhere to it because of the authority of Christian tradition. Such a person can be encouraged toward selflessness, which purifies the heart when it is undertaken. And even if only, even if only partially, it opens them up to be touched by the divine light and grace of God. At the same time, the most powerful evangelistic strategy with atheists and agnostics is simply to love them and to pray earnestly for them. They probably are tired of having people try to convert them, so it's unlikely that any arguments will win them over. I speak from experience. Arguments do not work, work, win them over. Invitations based on, on love, based on uh, acceptance, based on non-judgmentalism, those do open the door at least. Many agnostics and atheists are also probably burned out by the hypocrisy of so-called believers. How many times I, I've had critics of, of, of the Orthodox faith who have uh, challenged not just me, but Orthodoxy in general. You know, look at the people in your own church. Look at the hypocrites. You know, I'm sure if you look at the history of your parish father, there are people who were criminals, who were thieves, who were murderers, who were fornicators. And the answer is yes. But the reality is the church, at least the church on earth, is really a hospital. A divine hospital where the great physician, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is there for us to come and to be healed, to be strengthened, to be able to develop that strong, pure heart so that we can see God in all aspects of life. Which kind of begs the question, you know, how do we as Orthodox Christians utilize that, 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 that those two tools, love and prayer, to be able to reach out or to at least have a discussion with the agnostic and the atheist. Um, the worst thing we can do is to avoid them, is to try to, you know, not to even in encounter them or, or entertain, you know. And, and I find that really fascinating because for many Orthodox Christians, and I realize this might sound like a generalization, but my experience has taught me that there are very few people who are willing to share the good news in a non-judgmental -judge, non way. Um, we just celebrated Pentecost. And one of the things that I mentioned uh, at my church was that we are all called to be apostles and disciples and to share the good news. We are all called to be living manifestations of God's grace revealed. And one of the ways that we reveal that grace is by be being able to rub elbows, if you will, with agnostics and atheists. Not to be threatened by them, but to, to help encourage them to try to find the big picture by being selfless, by being sacrificial, by being, uh, as, we, as we talked about, you know, having good morals and, and trying to, to teach morality in, in society, which desperately needs it, if I might add. Um, a life that is lived in authentic love 
will preach the gospel to all of those around us. If someone doesn't want to believe, talking to him will never make him believe. But giving yourself selflessly for him may well provoke some other questions within that he's never considered before. Being kind to him when you are not required to do so may inspire him to want to know the source of your kindness. Um, I've said this many times in my parish. If you weren't wearing a cross, would people know that you're a Christian? And of course the answer has to be yes, if you're living a Christian life, if you're demonstrating those wonderful Christian virtues and values, or no, because you're not living a Christian life. Uh, good question. Are people who claim to be atheists committing the one unforgivable sin, that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Off the top of my head, I would say the answer is no, because they have not encountered the Holy Spirit through Christ. They have not had a, a personal experience. So, um, unlike Judas, who encountered the living Christ and rejected him, uh, there's not really a blasphemy from the Holy Spirit because they, they don't know the Holy Spirit. You know, Now, if they are presented with the evidence, and of course there's an, a lot of evidence, and they reject it, that's the sin. But just not knowing or denying based on, on, on one's own personal feelings is, is not really a sin. It's being enlightened and then rejecting that leads to, to the sin. One of the mistakes that at least Father uh, Andrew writes here uh, that we people make when, when speaking with agnostics or atheists or any person who does not share our faith is to believe that we can argue them into seeing the truth. Wrong. I have never known anyone who has successfully argued into a lasting, who has successfully been argued into a lasting faith. Um, One of the things that we can do is to show them that orthodoxy is truly non-judgmental. That orthodoxy is built on an encounter with the God-man, Jesus Christ. It is not built on stacking up enough incontrovertible evidence interpreted correctly through reason that anyone who comes upon such such a stack will have no choice to become a Christian. In other words, we can show them all the historical documents, all the scriptures. Um, it, will, it will mean nothing to them. Because orthodoxy, the faith, is built on an encounter with the living and, and, and all-powerful Savior. It's not something that can be coerced, whether by force of reason or any other kind of, of, of logic. We have to show them by love, by acceptance, through prayer. So to be converted to Jesus Christ means that a human person encounters him and somehow, in their own way, is mysteriously drawn to trust Jesus Christ and to unite with him. All we can do as Orthodox Christians is to open the path between that person and Christ, remembering that both persons have the freedom not to make the encounter. Our, strand, our strongest evangel, excuse me, our strongest evangelical tools are love. <coughs> excuse me, our love and prayer. So let's let's get really practical for a second. We say our our tools are love and prayer. What are we talking about? One of the things that I've, I've always hated is when someone I hear someone say, well, I'll pray for you. Great. Thank you very much. But are you, are you praying for the person to avoid really practically helping them? If a person is hungry, if a person is, is, is in need of clothing, of shelter, and we say, here's $5, I'll pray for you, what is being accomplished? The answer is nothing. 
if we go the extra mile for that person and show them that their needs can be met through help, through assistance, through guidance, through taking the time, we then show them Christ's compassion, Christ's love, Christ's ability to be all things for all people. That, more than anything, will help an atheist or agnostic realize that, wow, I, I, need to, I need to look at this more closely. So, that's it. Um, I hope this motivates all of us to take a look at how we are called to answer the challenges of those who are confused in the world, or who do not believe in God in today's world. Through love and prayer, I hope that we can use those tools to, to strengthen our own spiritual life so that we can manifest daily that love and that prayerful spirit to make a difference in bringing those who don't believe or those who are confused in their beliefs to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not by our words, but by our actions. So let me close with our prayer to the Most Holy Mother of God, as we usually do. Steadfast protectress of Christians, constant advocate before the Creator, do not despise the cry of us sinners, but in your goodness come speedy to help us who call upon you in faith. Hasten to hear us who call upon you and to intercede for us a Theotokos, for you always protect those who honor you. Our dear viewers, thank you for spending the time with us. We love you. We ask that you lift us all up in prayer as we do you, because in lifting each other up in prayer, we are truly united in Christ. Have a great day in the Lord.